My name is Lexi Savick. I'm a sales coordinator at Terabi. Uh, just so you know, we are recording today's session so that we can make it available to you afterwards. Um, I'm joined today by my colleague, Razvan. Hello. Uh, yes, uh, he's the lead R&D specialist and he'll be doing the bulk of today's presentation. Um, if we can just go to the next slide. So just an idea of the agenda for today, um, I'll give you a few words about Terabi, and then Razvan will take over and give an introduction into thermal uh, imaging technology, talk about some of its applications and use cases, and a little bit about the future of Industry 4.0. We do have a Q&A tab down at the bottom um, of the, your screen, so if you have any questions throughout the seminar, um, feel free to put them in there and I'll answer the, we'll get to those at the end of the presentation. Next slide, please. So Terabi is a sensor and sensing solutions company um, and we specialize in four main areas. You can see those here are LED range finders, 3D time of flight cameras, uh, radio frequency positioning systems, and of course thermal cameras, which we'll discuss today. Um, next slide. And this manifests itself in a range of products. Um, we have our sense, time of flight sensor modules, but we also have developed solutions in areas like level monitoring, smart building, mobile robotics, and industry 4.0. Uh, next slide. You can find more about these products and our company in general on our website. Um, we also have technical specifications, use cases, and information about different resellers we work with. So feel free to check that out at the end of the presentation. Uh, that's all for me, Razvan. I'll let you take it away. Thank you, Lexi. Hello, everyone. So today's topic, thermal imaging, more specifically infrared thermal imaging. Um, I think the first uh, point to discuss, especially if you have joined our previous webinars, regarding our time of flight uh, distance sensors is uh, what is infrared, since those ones are working in infrared as well. What we have here is an extract of the electromagnetic spectrum. From the left side, surrounded by a red uh, rectangle, we have the visible spectrum, so what we can see with our own eyes, followed by the infrared. We can clearly see that uh, the infrared uh, band is much larger than the visible band, and uh, therefore, it is uh, divided into uh, multiple uh, sub-regions. Starting from the closest one to the visible spectrum, we have uh, near-infrared, which is um, where most of the ranging technologies are working, our, our 3D time-of-flight sensors and our distance sensors are working in near-infrared. Then moving uh, toward soft, uh, shortwave infrared, we have most of the active illumination night vision technologies working. So your typical uh, surveillance camera that you put in the back uh, in the back garden, that one will most likely use a shortwave infrared LED to illuminate the area and then you have practically night vision. Now, moving into the actual thermal imaging, we have the medium wave infrared spectrum which is uh, generally used for high temperature measurement measurements with uh, cooled thermal cameras, which we will discuss in a second. And uh, last but not least, we have the long wave infrared, which is typically what most of the detectors are working on uh, nowadays. So uh, this is uh, specifically used for surveillance and near ambient temperature applications. And what we can see also in this chart is that from the right to left, we have uh, the lowest energy to the highest energy uh, particles. This means that an object, as it gets hotter, it will start emitting photons in, with the higher energy. This is why usually when an object is very hot, you can start seeing it with your own eye. So starting from around 550 degrees Celsius, they start uh, emitting in the visible spectrum. This is that uh, faint red glow. So now that we cleared that, what is thermal imaging? Well, knowing the previous uh, 
discussion about uh, the infrared spectrum and knowing that all objects that are not at absolute zero are emitting infrared radiation, we can take a, a very simple conclusion that thermal cameras are just simple detectors that instead of seeing the visible spectrum, focus on the infrared spectrum. In our case, generally medium wave and long wave infrared. As uh, humans, we cannot see infrared, but the thermal radiation we, we can feel. If you put your hand next to a hot cup of uh, tea, you, you will feel the, the radiation from the cup. So thermal cameras are just detectors for this. And uh, we can see in the, in the little animation on the right, that is, uh, taken, uh, that is a video taken with one of our cameras. Software is used to apply a false color map. So what we see there is just a, a relative difference between the pixel temperatures there that is applied via software. Now, a brief history of uh, thermal imaging. It started uh, very similarly to, to radar technology as a, as a military technology. Started in uh, the early 1950s um, when, it, when it started being used uh, by the US uh, military, it started being developed by the US military. For a very long time, the performance was not uh, not great. The first uh, devices were called uh, line detectors, and it will take about one hour to generate an image. So not a lot of uh, performance in the be beginning days. But uh, starting from the 1970s, uh, there has been a breakthrough, and the Royal Navy has started using thermal imagers during uh, fires on board of the, their military ships. And this is mainly because uh, long wave infrared has uh, the ability to see through smoke so it made the search and rescue operations quite uh, quite much quite a lot easier now in the 1980s is when microbolometer technology has been invented and nowadays this is by far the most uh, common uh, detector that you will see on the market and it was not until 1992 that the u.s government declassified the technology so the the availability of uh, commercial devices started then and uh, in the late 90s early 2000s starting with uh, firefighters again because of the ability to to see through smoke so for search and rescue operations uh, it has been, this technology has been adopted in the non military uh, industries while with starting with fire, firefighters followed by medicine and then industry as we know it now, the current technologies are split into two main um, detector types. The first one is microbolometers. We, we are going to look at both of them in terms of pros and cons and how they, they work. Now, microbolometers, as a, in, a, in very simple terms, are detectors that have a sensing element. And as the photons are hitting this element, it changes, it, it is heating it up thus changing its electrical resistance, which can then be measured and uh, a temperature can be derived from that. Now, the difference between cooled and uncooled microbolometers, as we can see there, is that cooled microbolometers, although they work in the same basic principle, they have a cooling system behind them, usually uh, liquid uh, nitrogen, if I'm not mistaken, but uh, can also be a Stirling uh, engine. So what, what this does is it removes the bias of the detector's own temperature, which means that a cooled microbolometer can detect even a single photon, whereas an uncooled detector can, uh, an uncooled microbolometer needs a bit more uh, uh, photons to, to be sensitive to. Now, moving into the thermopiles, we have uh, a very old uh, technology here that work. It's uh, thermocouples. So the working principle here is we have two dissimilar metals connected, and the difference in temperature as the photons are hitting them generates a voltage. And this technology is uh, 
much much older than microbolometers. But up until recently, it has been difficult to to put into multi-pixel uh, detectors. Now, in terms of characteristics, starting from the left side, we have the the best performing uh, microbolometers, which are the cooled ones. They are as well the most expensive devices on on the market, and they are quite uh, quite big in terms of uh, size and uh, and weight as well. So these ones are reserved for very specialized uh, applications. Now, moving into the uncooled microbolometers, they have a slightly worse performance, but they are much cheaper, they are much smaller, and they can run at room temperature. So they don't need the active cooling system behind them. A common uh, characteristic of both microbolometers due to the way the detector works is that uh, their spectral response depends on the material used for the detector. So that means that if a microbolometer has a detector that only responds to medium wave infrared, then that microbolometer will only respond to medium wave infrared. And this will be important in just a second when we discuss thermophiles, which have slightly worse performance than uncooled microbolometers, or at least historically have had slightly worse performance, not anymore. Um, they are by far the cheapest. In terms of uh, form factor, they are just as uh, small as uncooled microbolometers, but with a longer lifespan uh, as well, they can run at uh, room temperature. And most importantly, their spectral response is not dependent on the wavelength. So these metals are reacting and are generating this voltage regard regardless of uh, the wavelength being in uh, long wave or in medium wave. And what does this mean? It means that you if you have a detector that is based on thermopile, you can put a lens on top of it that is coated to only allow long wave infrared. And then that detector will detect only long wave infrared. But then you can switch the lens to one that only allows medium wave, and you have a detector that works in medium wave. So they are a bit more versatile in this uh, in this manner. Now, in terms of applications, uh, there are quite a few that they are being used uh, nowadays, starting with military, of course, since it has uh, the technology has it has its roots in uh, military tech use. Um, we have everything from uh, surveillance to target acquisition to tracking. We have uh, homing munitions. In fact, the top picture on the right side is a air-to-air heat-seeking seeking missile. So that little dome on top, on the tip of the missile, uh, contains a thermal camera, which will uh, track the heat signature of the target. Firefighting again. It is being used for both search and rescue and for situational awareness. We can see on the sec in the second picture a house that is on fire, and this uh, thermo thermal camera allows the firefighters to see where the hot spots are, so where the fire is at the strongest. Thermal imagers are used as well in astronomy. The third photo is uh, an image of uh, Andromeda galaxy taken uh, in uh, infrared and overlaid on, on, a, on a visible image. So it is being used to, to see through the smoke clouds, or gas clouds in this uh, case. And finally, the last picture is uh, a drone surveilling a farm of solar panels. So what we can see there is we have a little uh, zoomed in image and I don't know if it's exactly visible, but two of those panels or three are much hotter than their neighbors. So this means that those panels are malfunctioning and thus this uh, thermal camera allows for, for scanning of the entire farm of solar panels quite, quite quickly. Now, you will see that I've uh, emphasized a few of these applications, the quality control in production environments, predictive maintenance, and flame detection. And this is because this would be the applications where we will focus going forward. 
because they all pertain to the same concept, Industry 4.0. Now, this term has been around for, for quite a while and it is being claimed to be the next, uh, the next big thing in the, in the industry. But what does it actually mean? So, of course, this is just an extract. It, uh, in, in reality, Industry 4.0 has uh, a lot more concepts to it, but uh, I've extracted just a few. What we are looking at is increased automation because there is a need for, for better networking and inter-machine networks so that we can, uh, <clears throat> that we can uh, allow machines to handle this decisions without human involvement. There is a need for increased control as well. So we need to monitor more processes. We need to gather more data. And because technology is getting cheaper, we, we can implement this, uh, this monitoring on processes and subsystems that they were too cost prohibitive previously. Now, these two concepts have a very clear goal which is smart factories. And uh, one of the pillars identified within Industry 4.0 for smart factories is uh, decentralized decision making. So the ability of these uh, cyber physical systems, of uh, all the monitoring and uh, automation systems to make decisions on their own and to perform their tasks as autonomously as possible. Now, how can we achieve this decentralized decision making and smart factories with smart sensors? And this is where Terabi innovates. We have just launched our Int Thermal 90, which is an industrial grade rugged IP65 thermal camera. It has a 32 by 32 pixel resolution and a field of view of 90 degrees. And most importantly, it has embedded intelligence which we will get back in a bit. Now, as a te core technology, it is using the thermopile detector and it is working in the long wave infrared spectrum. It can measure temperatures from minus 20 plus 670 and it has an accuracy of plus minus two degrees Celsius or 2%. In terms of sensitivity, which basically means the, the lowest change in temperature that we can detect. It's uh, 329 millikelvins, which uh, equates to about uh, 0.3 degrees Celsius. So quite, uh, quite sensitive in that sense, especially for, for industrial processes. And going back to the embedded intelligence, we have three applications that run on this uh, device. And these applications can or can uh, take some decisions on their own. So we have one ap application one, which is a simple uh, min max scan over the entire field of view so that the control system, instead of having to read the entire image and then do its own processing, can just read the min max of the, um, that, that our sensor puts on the network. So this application as well can be can be customized by the end user to to trigger a response by its own. So without the need of the central supervision unit, we have the the NONC output, which uh, as we can see, all the applications can uh, can trigger it. And this means that if the sensor is programmed to see to trigger this NONC at a temperature of 50 degrees, anytime the temperature reaches or exceeds 50 degrees, we have a, an actual pin that will uh, trigger, for example, a relay or, or an emergency stop of the system, depending on how the network and the sensor is configured. Now, application two is a, is a center area measurement. So we have uh, this uh, rectangle this square in the center of the field of view which we can program in size from uh, as uh, small as two by two pixels to as big as the entire field of view and this application takes uh, 
the pixels in both space and time and averages them, then compares the resulting temperature to the user-defined thresholds and again can trigger an alarm or just uh, put this uh, resulting temperature on the network for the process from the central processing you need to, to read. Now, application three is the our region of interest monitoring. Here we have um, an example where we use uh, 16 by 16 areas. So our entire field of view is split into four areas, which can be, again, monitored independently. And all these pixels get averaged spatially and um, and uh, in, from from time, so we can average over four pixels, over four frames. Sorry, and uh, the resulting um, measurements can be put on the on the network, or a decision can be taken again via the NONC output. Now, going into a bit more detail in the applications, um, application one, we have uh, identified one uh, use case based on our customers. Um, which is a temperature monitoring of electrical boxes and relays. So we have the sensor in front of this uh, electrical cabinet. The user can define its own threshold and we can actually do fire prevention, not just fire detection. If the, if the threshold and, and the characteristics of the electrical cabinet are known, the threshold can be programmed to trigger an alarm way before the actual point where uh, something will ignite. Now, another, another application identified by one of our customers for application two is uh, the monitoring of extruded material. We have had um, one of our partners that had uh, this uh, brick furnace where the bricks were coming and they wanted to monitor the temperature of the bricks coming out of the furnace. So this was a quality control process that they implemented our, our device that previously was too, too expensive to, to put a full-fledged microbolometer. So they didn't do it and they chose uh, the in thermal 90. So what they do here is they have the, the continuous flow of extruded material of uh, bricks in this case. And in fact, what they did here, they programmed the sensor to work standalone. So there is no central unit that supervises. They have just programmed the threshold and they have connected the NONC output of the sensor to a, to a water nozzle. So every time the sensor detects some um, areas that are not uniformly cooled, it triggers the water and uh, it cools down the, the brick to the same temperature. Now, application three, uh, it's a, this one is very customizable and it can be used as well for, for uh, electrical cabinet monitoring or industrial baking. The areas can be programmed as small as two by two. So we can have a total of 256 areas monitored simultaneously and we can, um, we can take an action based on the program settings. Now, we have up here a very interesting use case by one of our partners. They are a company that uh, specializes in the thermal characterization of tires for Formula One and the motorsport in general. And what they did is they compared the performance of our in thermal 90 to a microbolometer that is uh, in the range of uh, 7,000 euros. And uh, we have here our their testimonial where our sensor actually performed the uh, quite on par with the, with the 7,000 euro device. So that is a, a great thing and the use case that we, we did not initially think, but it's amazing to see how uh, our devices are being used. And to, to, to end, I will just uh, make a summary of how therapy is enabling industry 4.0. Well, going back to the decentralized decision making, we are providing local decision making capabilities based on embedded applications. We are able to provide 
just process data to the central unit if there is a need for a central unit. So we remove the, the need for the central unit to process the raw thermal data coming from the sensor, and we just give out, we just output the, the temperature of the wanted area. We provide highly customizable devices that can interface with the rest of the factory or work standalone, as we saw in, uh, in the brick uh, application. We provide tools that allow for easy setup with a minimal learning curve. Our sensor comes with a, with a nice user interface that runs on Windows. So you can pre-program all the settings and then just plug it in in your desired spot. It can work without the need of further, further setup. And we do all of this while keeping the, the end user cost much lower than, than the current uh, in the current market and that is all from me if you want to read more about uh, the interval 90 you can uh, you can go to our website and uh, see more of the applications as well as the spec sheet and user manual thank you and now we will move to the q a yes thanks razvan for that presentation we do have a couple minutes left so um i've got some questions here for you uh, the first one is from Paul. He's asking if there were three animals in the field of view looking from above, could your camera be used to determine if they are all roughly the same body temperature or if one is higher than the others? Okay, that's a that's an interesting uh, question. Um, the problem with animals is that it depends which kind. Um, if they are furry animals, it is very difficult to detect them. You can look even at the most performant cooled cameras. Okay, with a cooled microbolometer, you could see, but in general, the fur of the animals are is very thermally isolating. So you don't really see through it. They would mostly look like ambient temperature. So unfortunately, this is very limited unless we are talking about animals without, uh, without a thick layer of fur. And in that case, yes, it could be used. Okay, great. Um, we have another question here. Uh, how do embedded applications work and can they run in parallel? Yes, um, the embedded applications are customized by the user. So each of them is working independently. Uh, each of them ha can be programmed with its own threshold in terms of hot or cold and can be programmed on which threshold to trigger and they can be individually activated or deactivated uh, they can be individually allowed or not allowed to trigger the nonc output and they can work in parallel as, as well so you can have one application running you can have two or you can have all three great um, and then I think we have time for just one more. So um, let's see. Can you get the pixel data out from the sensor, for example, to reconstruct an image? Yes, definitely. So although we do this, uh, all this processing on, on board, we do offer the, the possibility to, to extract the, the actual image. You, the, the master on the network, the central unit, can request the, the pixel values, and then using them, it can reconstruct the, the image that the sensor is currently seeing. Great, and then we do have a follow-up from Paul about the animal question. The animal that he's referring to is a cow, and he says, appreciate, I appreciate that you can't give an absolute body temperature, but in the case of comparing them, you know, would you, able to be, would you be able to see that one is hotter than the other, for example? Okay, um, that that's a, that's an interesting question. I would say yes. In general, we should be able to to see relative differences as as long as they are above our thermal sensitivity. So in our case, uh, 0 0.3, 0 0.4 degrees Celsius, depending on also also depends on the distance to to the cow. So if the sensor is placed very high on the ceiling, you can expect that. Uh, there will have the difference will have to be more considerable between the cows but uh, th that's quite an interesting application and i think it's worth uh, having a follow-up via email 
Yes. And on that note, <laughs> um, we are just about at time. So uh, if anybody does have any questions, feel free to reach out to Razvan, myself, or anybody at the Terabi team. Um, we'll be sending out a follow-up email after the webinar so you can contact us that way. Um, of course, you can also get our contact information on the web our website. Um, thank you, Razvan, for your presentation, and um, thank, you. thank you, everybody, for participating. We do have future webinars coming up, so um, keep an eye out for those. And yes, if you don't have any other questions, then we will call it a day. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining. Bye-bye.